Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Today, we are honored to be sitting down and chatting with District 2 Councillor Kristen Toms of Sturgeon County, Alberta. Nestled in the heart of Alberta, Sturgeon County stands as a testament to the province's diverse and captivating landscapes. Now, just a stone's throw away from the provincial capital of Edmonton, this county offers a unique blend of rural tranquility and urban accessibility. Bordered by the North Saskatchewan River to the south, Sturgeon County showcases a picturesque tapestry of rolling hills, lush farmlands, and meandering waterways, creating the idyllic setting for residents and visitors alike. This is Cross Border Interviews with Councillor Kristen Toms. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start at the beginning and get to know who the councillor is behind the councillor persona. So I want to start with a basic question, but it's an important question to sort of kick off the entire interview. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, councillor? Oh, um, <laughs> you know, that's kind of uh, the question is going to be given a long winded answer, unfortunately. I have always been one of those people that when I see things happening that I don't like, I intervene and I will comment on it. Um, I've had the bad luck, I guess, of breaking up a few fights in my life due to that. Um, if there's an issue occurring that I see happening outside my sphere, I've never been one of those people to stare at it and not go towards it. I will stop, you know, or if people needs help, need help, I'm absolutely 100% engaged in that. I'll pick up rolling away. Sorry, I was in the supermarket parking lot the other day. So I will run after cans that have fallen out of someone's bag or hold doors or alternately, if I see a situation occurring that I don't agree with, um, I'll intervene. So I think this was sort of a natural progression for me. Um, my interest in politics arose when I was actually living in another municipality. And there was uh, a lot of struggles there with respect to how duties were being performed. Um, the other municipality at that time, who I won't note the name at this stage, um, ended up actually having an investigation by municipal affairs. Now they were found to be clear, but there was a vast number of red flags with respect to how they were doing their public consultation with people. Um, and honestly, it was frustrating. And when I'm frustrated, I don't just sit and complain about it, I do something. <laughs> So your story is quite interesting because I did a little bit of a deep dive on you prior to this interview because I, I like to learn a little bit about your electoral history. Mm -hmm. Your first election isn't a municipal election. It's a municipal by-election, if I'm not mistaken. Correct yes. me if I'm wrong if this is not the first time you decided to put your name forward. But in 2019, there is a vacancy on council for District 2, and you decide to put your name forward. I've got to ask the stupid, important question here. What was it about that vacancy that you said, okay, now it's Kristen's time to step up? Because you could have continued to go about your day chasing after the cans that fell out of the basket, but you decided to chase the municipal can and that fell out of the basket. What happened there? So I don't know if you've ever read Mitch Albom's book, The Seven People You'll Meet in Heaven. Um, fantastic book, first of all. But I have a friend that became one of my seven people, I'm pretty sure, on the evening that that by-election was announced. And she... Uh, she sent me over Facebook Messenger the article that said the Division Two counselor has resigned and said, I think you would be fabulous at this. And I said, well, thank you. I appreciate the confidence. And I started to contemplate it at that point. But prior to that, living in this division for the last couple of years, I noted that there was things that we didn't have that were probably required at this stage of development. Now, Sturgeon County is a, mun is a uh, rural municipality, as you know, but we do have pockets of urban development. Uh, I'm in a pocket that's more of an urbanized development here, and I had noted that we were missing nice to have things like crosswalks on busy roads where people were going 100 kilometers an hour or a specific intersection that was atrocious and would have cars lined up for 10, 15, 20 minutes before they could get around the corner and also historically had a vast number of accidents. So I guess for me, it was sort of the um, combination of the 
you should have a look at this and going, yeah, I have been kind of looking at what could be done better and what's needed and what's not. And I thought, you know what, I'm at a stage in my prior career where I was successful, but not happy because it was not the type of career that filled my bucket at all. Uh, whereas helping people always had. So I, uh, put my name forward and here I am. <laughs> was it an easy decision? Because getting asked to put your name forward and putting yourself out there is completely different than running a business. In my opinion, you could uh -huh. be, you could have something different in your opinion, but I, I believe that putting yourself on a ballot and going out and asking people to vote for you is a completely new game for a lot of people for the first time to experience that for you. Was it something of a challenge to get out there and sort of say, here's my vision for what Sturgeon County district two should look like? So it wasn't a super hard decision for me. I knew what happens when people go into the public eye. I know that they can be demonized or turned into saints very, very quickly, depending on, depending on your perspective. Um, I knew if I went into it and I was successfully elected, there was going to be people that regardless of how conscientious I was or how careful or how, um, how well I tried to make the decisions I made would dislike me. Now, I also had, um, once I got into the process of the campaigning, um, door knocking was interesting. And I actually was subject to my first ever political attack from the uh, old mayor of the other municipality that I had lived in. Um, he actually put a candidate up against me and a very strong candidate who'd had a lot of notoriety in their community, but lived in ours. So um, it was a fascinating process. And right off the cuff, like I say, I had some some interesting times. <laughs> so you get elected in 2019 and mm -hmm. you, you get acclaimed in 2021. So no one runs against you in 2021. Yeah. So you were coming up to now four years of you being on council, just roughly four years, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, that by-election was in November. Was it what you expected looking back on pre-counselor Tom's mm -hmm. to now <laughs> counselor Tom's? Was it what you expected? And what was the biggest eye-opening experience for yourself in your time in office so far? Um, so it wasn't what I expected. Uh, there's a lot, lot more about sewage in my life than I ever anticipated there would be. I mean, I was generally one of those happy people that just wandered around and flushed the toilet and didn't really think about what happened after the fact. So there's a wide array of information. And honestly, you realize how important it is that the people that get elected are flexible and able to um, take in new information fast, because it would be very rare for someone to come into this job and understand absolutely every aspect of it going forward. Um, I see the surprises for me. I guess I was a little bit surprised by how committed to ideologies people are regardless of logic or information. Um, you can be providing lists of facts that can be demonstrated, repeated and done, and still there's question as to the validity of them. <laughs> but do they not have the right to question the validity of them? Because that's their responsibility is to ask the questions that they believe is right and your job as counselors to sort of direct them into sort of the right area and say, you're mm -hmm. You, you're mis, misinformed and here's the information that has been provided mm -hmm. to us from administration. Is that not right? Absolutely agree. And you know what? I am happier when people are questioning me to an extent than I am if they're not questioning me that blindly believe everything they hear. It's important that we have a society that that does question things because some things are wrong. Some things shouldn't happen. And you require that myriad of opinions. I guess for me, it was the dedication like in the face of absolute fact to ideas that were refuted that is the surprise how tightly people will hold i could say this water is boiling it could have bubbles in it and steam coming off it and burn the crap out of your hand and someone could still say no but it's not really boiling is it mm, yeah it is i think so um i actually don't mind being questioned in some ways i like it because i i it helps me drill down and really hopefully be able to articulate in a better manner or in a different manner, so different groups of people can understand. <laughs> are, are the people of District 2 willing to give their opinions on the issues that are in front of the county, or are they talking about more jurisdictional roles that the municipality, the county doesn't deal with, whether it be healthcare, education? Do you find that people are actually talking about the municipal issues? Well, it depends. Sometimes they're talking about municipal issues. I hear an awful lot of... Um, frustration that would go into the federal camp, let's say with respect <laughs> to, yeah, the criminal justice system, 100% is a huge frustration. 
I know when I was campaigning, I was very, very surprised by the number of folks that really didn't have a great understanding of how um, how politics is divided in Canada, whether it be municipal, provincial, or federal. And yet there's definitely a huge clashing of ideologies um, coming out of the party-driven systems as opposed to us municipal councillors who, as you well know, are just independently elected. People wanting to know which party you supported or or um, what you felt on abortion or what you felt on some other, other uh, impression out of your sort of jurisdictional area. Although I understand that question because they are, of course, looking for people with, I guess, some sort of a like mind to represent them. Um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of muddle between all the layers. <laughs> Is it more because you're the closest to the people as well? Because you you make a decision, you go into your grocery store the day after and people know who you are, I'm assuming mm -hmm. know who you are. But the MLA, the MP aren't in their community 24, mm -hmm. 7, 7 days a week. And they have larger areas than District 2. They uh, encompass a larger area. So is it the fact that maybe you're the most accessible to them? Mm -hmm. I think that convenience has a lot to do with it in this convenience driven society. Absolutely. Like when you call my phone, I answer that phone. When you call an MLA's phone, unless you've got the special number, you've got an assistant and they're sort of vetting the call. So there certainly is that difference. Also, I think um, people are very frustrated with some of the other layers. Let's call it the federal government at this stage of the game. So anybody they can get to hear them. Um, there's been a lot of sort of hangover drip over to the municipal side of folks that are currently, um, I like to call it feeling threatened maybe by what's occurring in the country. So um, we've been undergoing a lot of dialogue with a very small percentage, but a very vocal percentage of people that are making accusations like we're being paid by the World Economic Forum, or we are being paid Hold on by a second. Did nations. you just say that, are you getting accused of that? Yes. Municipally? Yes. Yes. Uh, and absolutely, there's, yes, large groups of individuals, and they've sort of joined. I mean, there was an issue with a land use bylaw in a county adjacent to ours, which seems to have launched a thousand websites. And it's mostly the same folks that are all hooking onto these same voice of whatever fill in the county name websites. But the accusations on them are straight and forthright that we are being paid off by the United Nations and paid by the World Economic Forum to further some nefarious agenda. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what the nefarious agenda is exactly. I've actually done some research to try to understand where their fears are coming from, but uh, it's created a lot of additional issues when you're dealing with um, an ideological group, which mostly has issues with feds or global politics but it's landing directly on your doorstep and you're receiving both the accusations and the uh, fascinating background ideas. Well, I feel like we could just talk about an hour just on this subject, but I, I, I feel like <laughs> if I do, we're going down a rabbit hole that even Alice won't want to go down. So yeah. I, I want, I want, I want to sort of ask about the, role of the counselor, if, if you don't mind here for a second, because we have people who listen to the show who are considering putting their name forward for counsel, because in Alberta, we have two years left. We have listeners in Ontario, we have listeners across, and even in Saskatchewan who are heading to the polls this year. You have to make some pretty tough choices around that council table, and you probably know better than I do that those decisions are going to impact the resident's day-to-day's life. That means taxes, that means service levels, that means this, mm -hmm. that, or the other. How do you make those tough choices with the understanding that the decisions you are about to make may impact someone's pocketbook or may impact someone's ability to get to a, a program that they desperately need? It is a huge amount of responsibility because you're not in any way hidden from these decisions. Like I'm fond of telling people any decision that I make that impacts you, impacts me and impacts my family just as directly. So you do your best to listen to the individual voices, the loud folks, and then you also have to look at it in the context of the overall county and community and the health and well-being within that. So this decision may, may negatively infect, affect these two people, but there's 10,000 people behind them that it's going to positively impact. Sometimes it's a weight and a balance. Um, with respect to taxes, it has to stop somewhere. Taxes have to stop elevating somewhere. I mean, the taxpayer pocketbook is not limitless. And 
three levels with their hands in to varying degrees is challenging. And I personally don't like paying taxes. Nobody does. But I understand that we live in a society. We live with multiple people with varying needs, varying abilities, and you have to take care of your population in the best way that you know how. Um, so it's a constant weight and a constant balance of those decisions, sometimes individual to community. You know, Does it, it get easier? No. <laughs> Oh, unequivocally, no. In fact, it might even get harder because you'll always end up meeting those individuals that rip at your heartstrings, no matter what, have the most compelling thing to say, you know, we're in a horrible position. You're doing your best to help them to satisfy the needs of the community in its entirety. And there is not a good answer. There is no 100% great answer that everybody's going to go, hallelujah, Eureka, you figured it out. You figured out the magic recipe. So you do the best that you can by weighing out the fact, the information, the logic, the needs, the wants. It's a constant tightrope act, a constant balance. And do I know if we ever get it right? I'm not sure. You do the best that you can. So you can look in the mirror in the morning and go, I considered these things to the best of my ability um, and had the outcome that I that you know was the best that I could have in this situation. But is it ever perfect? It's never perfect. <laughs> How important is it? Because you talk about listening to the loud voices and that that's important. Listen to the people who disagree with you. Mm -hmm. But how important is it for yourself as a counselor when you're making those decisions to not just listen to the echo chambers, the social medias and actually get out and actually talk to the people on the street? Because mm -hmm. don't get me wrong. Everyone does it. We see what's going on on social media and we sort of think that is what's happening in the world, but it's not. It mm -hmm. truly isn't, I believe. For you as a counselor, when you're making those tough decisions, when you ask people, are they willing to say, it's not going to affect me, so do whatever you want? Or are they willing to say, okay, give us, give me your options and let me try to figure this out with you? It's a little bit of both. It depends on the person 100%. And it, honestly, I think it depends a lot on where the individual is in their own lives. I think... Um, a lot of motivation, a lot of loud voices are motivated ultimately by fear, um, by fear of change, by fear of what's different. So constantly being cognizant of that is important. The folks that tend to be more rational and willing to listen to your opinion are often the ones that are less impacted by that particular issue. I mean, you have a whole bunch of gradients in terms of impact, involvement, emotional context. So it really depends on who you're speaking to. I've had great conversations with people. And one of the things about being in the community, which I am, I spend a ton of time out at events and visiting people, that two-way dialogue where you can stand in front of each other, both as human beings, even me, I mean, my I was kind of worried my soul would be sucked out of my body in this job, but so far I still have it. Um, so, so some of those dialogues are great, super beneficial. You're able to explain them things. They're able to explain to you. You come to a middle and you go, yeah, that's a great solution. Other times you can have a conversation and you may as well be talking to your wall. <clears throat> Is it hard to balance the role of District 2 counselor with Sturgeon County counselor? Because when you're elected, you're elected as a district counselor, but when you make decisions, you can't look at each de decision as, oh, how is this going to impact District 2? You have to look at how is this going to impact Sturgeon County? So for you, how do you balance the needs and wants of your district with your community as a whole? That's a great question, asking me how I balance. And it depends on the issue, uh, realistically, where you kind of end up landing and, and the common sense and the logic with it. Um, for me, the overall health of the community, I don't believe one division can be healthy while the other ones are not. And I know this is another struggle that we have because counselors understand this to varying degrees. I actually heard out of a fellow counselor's mouth in the last week that they just didn't care um, about the remainder of the county. So it's frustrating. Um, I know that my area, like I say, cannot be healthy without the other areas being healthy. And just like we are in Canada with various provinces having various roles, our divisions have different roles. Division two per se has been tagged as the development for more housing. Well, I have a youth advisory committee that's telling me as kids, they can't live in this county. There's no housing options. There's no ability for them to stay here. So a priority for me is ensuring that our families can stay within our community. So I know we need to develop. I have a lot of people within my division that feel like nothing other than their home should have been developed here or be developed here in the future. 
So I have to balance between people wanting things to stay the same here and ensuring that our youth and our seniors um, have the ability to with it, live within the community. So my balance for that is I've got the future of the community at hand. I know that the impacts of future development can be mitigated within the existing community. So that's how I balance it out a little bit. Other divisions so, have different issues. <laughs> so the, it brings up a good segue into our next segment here, and that is the county as a whole. Now, before I, I, I start this line of questioning, I'm going to preface this by saying this is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is the councillor's opinion of what's going on in Sturgeon County. I just want to make sure because we get emails from time to time on this question. Uh -huh. Councillor, in your opinion, Opinion. You talk about housing, you talk about uh, the need to retain people living in the county community, whether it be seniors or youth. What do you see as the biggest challenge facing Sturgeon County in 2024 and into the future? Mm. Wow, that's a great question. There are so many big issues. Or issues. You can say one, you can say three, you can say five, you can say okay. 20. It just, it, it depends on what you say is depending on what I follow up with. <laughs> so... For me, obviously, as I noted, there's one taxpayer and I feel like Canada is uber maxed out on our taxation. Um, so I want to be able to keep the taxes low, but sustain an appropriate quality of life for my residents. And um, that's both needs and wants with respect to services. So a huge priority for me is bringing in economic diversification into the area so we can sustain our services, etc., with industry and businesses as opposed to individual taxpayers. Um, so for me, that economic development is core, especially since we do know that we have a lot of downloading of costs to us from the provincial government. And I'm assuming the provincial government probably complains about downloading from the federal government too. So I realize I'm not autonomous in that. Um, but for me, economic diversification allows us to meet our goals in our other areas, whether it be housing development or retention of our youth or spots for our seniors. I mean, money, right? Everybody needs it in order to be able to do what they need to do. <laughs> so the million dollar follow-up question to that answer is, how do you do it? How do you diversify the economy when the economy is so sluggish right now? We are not seeing the growth that we are anticipating, but people say that Alberta is growing and I believe them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm going, you, you go to different communities, you go to rural Alberta and you're not seeing that growth happening. You're seeing it in more urban centers. So what is Sturgeon County doing to attract uh, businesses, residents to the community sort of to get those sort of diversification happening? Mm -hmm to get mm -hmm. that diversification happening? So there's a vast number of things we're undertaking. Number one, permitting. Um, so I guess on a local level, if I speak to it at a local level, making business permitting more streamlined and easier to do. I know we've all heard multiple complaints from every municipality that there's red tape out the yin yang and they can't possibly set up a business. So um, just on the basis level, ensuring that our staff in-house and our policies in-house are there to enable um, businesses to be here well, and people to live with those businesses. We are also very lucky in Sturgeon County that we are part of the Alberta industrial heartland. We have three carbon capture lines coming into the county, with which is super positive and unique because as we know that we are all looking at ESG, environmental social governance, corporations are as well. Um, so creating the conditions to allow industry to come into our region and work with us. That means we need to compete on a global scale. So there's a myriad of ways you can undertake that incentivization. And you have to look, like I say, out through the entire globe because companies are very mobile nowadays. So creating that ability to have them here, um, working both with the private industry we have here right now to create synergies and just creating the actual climate for it, whether it's tax incentives or providing water into an area, um, you create the conditions to bring people here. Can I ask a very stupid question right now? And please do not sure. think too much into this. Mm -hmm. Sturgeon County is a stone's throw away from the capital of this province, mm -hmm. Edmonton. And I say this with sort of an honest to goodness uh, like inquiry from myself. 
How do you diversify your economy when you have potentially one of the largest or the largest municipality in the province saying, hey, come set up in the capital. Don't go to the rural communities, like set up here. Is it hard to be sort of butt up close to that community when sort of they're growing at a fast pace while you're trying to get these sort of leftovers? Um, it is. And we have different taxes as well. I mean, there's advantages to being close to the community, but not necessarily in it. One of it is geography. We've got space here. Yeah. So it'd be very hard to set up, uh, you know, a major plant of some kind in the middle of Edmonton. So geography is a benefit. Plus a lot of these places, they don't actually want near giant urban centers. I know our division six has been largely depopulated to have the industrial heartland there because it's not necessarily conducive to having a home right next door to, you know, six factories. So there's advantages and disadvantages as we go. Um, Sometimes it can be frustrating because I am from a smaller municipality. We don't have a huge population. And a lot of the time we bend to the major population, regardless of whether it has the advantages or disadvantages of a smaller one. So um it can be both frustrating and helpful. We have a ready labor force sitting in Edmonton, a lot of educated folks. We have some fantastic educational institutes. I know Nate is now going out to expand their ability to train trades from 8,000 to 13,000 a year. So that's a huge advantage to be sitting right next door to that. I appreciate your uh, your candor and your answer on that. Um, I, 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 was, I, I recently had the pleasure of chatting with Cara Westerland of Brazo County on the show. And uh-huh. she accused, she she didn't accuse me outright, but she did say that when can we talk about the good things that are happening in our community? And uh-huh. Instead of just the challenges, let's talk about the good things. <laughs> so I've had to ask this question, and this is uh, honestly because of her, and I, I can't believe I didn't think about it after doing almost 700 episodes of this. But what does Sturgeon County do right? What is the thing that when you go to RMA, you go to speak to other municipalities, you say Sturgeon County's got it going on in X, Y, and Z. What are the issues that you say you guys are doing right? So I think we have great foresight and a good understanding of what our assets and strengths are. Mostly, like I say, related to two specific areas. We have an airport here, um, Villeneuve Airport, which was supposed to take over sort of once the city center was closed. It hasn't come into fruition that way, but um, we know that with respect to the movement of commodities and goods, if you've got that trifecta of rail, road, and air, you're in a fabulous condition. So we're looking at that as a way to work with Edmonton International Airports to create something new and different out here. So we're looking at that area specifically. It's one of our strengths. It's one of the assets we have here to develop it, um, to add that. And again, the industrial heartland. Another one of our strengths is just we've got that location. We've got those carbon capture pipelines. We're off a river if we could bring appropriate water to it. So playing to some of our strengths, and we do have a very strong agricultural community. And now that we're talking a lot about value-added agriculture and the agribusiness business, I mean, I hadn't heard the words protein fractionation ever in my entire nut life. Now I know you can do both wet and dry protein fractionation to pull protein out of a pea as opposed to eating a cow. I mean, there's fantastic amount of opportunities within ag as well. Plus looking at the fact that I know it's been predicted by various organizations that only very few, I've heard as low as seven countries within the world will be able to produce enough food to export coming in future days, I guess, whether it's related to climate change or population growth or what, but huge advantage. We're preserving our agricultural land here. We'll be able to feed the planet and hopefully with adapting innovation, which Sturgeon County is very good at listening to new ideas. We were the first municipality around here on board with hydrogen. In fact, the hydrogen hub was started um, from my municipality, the mayor and our CAO were integral for that. So, so the innovation, I guess for me, the, the short answer to this is we combine the innovation with our current strengths and assets. You have talked about a range of issues and you've talked about the challenges, you've talked about the accomplishment. Mm-hmm. Now, if I go talk to 100 people, 10 people in Sturgeon County, District 2, let's put it there, and I ask them the so those two same questions. They're going to give me a range of different answers that you just give that compared to what they would give. How do you balance that? Because you have to look at the county as a whole and you have to look at the challenges as a whole. 
But you can't forget about the micro issues, the issues that are important to the people who are there. I need a new uh, road on my street because I I hate all the potholes. I need yeah. a new sidewalk in front of my area because the sidewalk is dilapidated. How do you balance that knowing, because we talk about taxes a lot on this show, how do you, how do you balance the needs of the community with the individual knowing that there's only one taxpayer and you don't have a lot of money? Mm hmm. Yeah, great question. Well, like I say, I see that our means to getting to that, to being able to supply those things without tax increases regularly, and we've been very conservative in my municipality on this for years, having a number of 0% increases per year is to develop those industries so I can fix those potholes without taking it directly out of the taxpayer's pocket. But I mean, you're talking to someone who got engaged in politics basically because we didn't have crosswalks. So <laughs> I understand the micro level the quality of life, what the people are living for, they're here because it's beautiful. You can walk outside and, you know, during certain seasons, we've got canola fields in full bloom around the area. You see people walking along the river valley, checking out the frogs and things like that. The reason we want to develop the economy is to provide that quality of life. Everything we do essentially is to provide quality of life, I guess, bottom line. And that for some people could mean just the ability to survive and eat. And for other people, it's being able to walk in a river valley where it's natural paths. <laughs> Is it challenging though? Because you're talking about economic diversification that potentially might not happen for five, 10, 15, 20 mm -hmm. years, but they're okay. living here, the here and now. And the here and now is my road is completely, di I'm not saying that Sturgeon County yeah. roads are bad. I do not think that I'm saying that at all. Please, please uh -huh. not that. I'm just saying yeah. that it is hard to balance the future prospects of a community with the here and now of the community because the people mm -hmm. here living here and now are the ones who are paying those taxes. So you take little bites out of the apple, I guess. You um, evaluate projects. Is it hard to pick winners and losers at the end of the day then? Because not know, everyone's going to get what they want out of that small bite of the apple. Often the answer is obvious. If the road is cracked into 5,000 little pieces versus someone who's still able to walk the road, then the cracked into pieces one gets done. Yeah. Um, often the situation itself allows itself to make the decision in some ways. And for me, you've got that hierarchy, which I guess is your normal psychological hierarchy. I don't know who did it, Maslow or whomever determined it, but safety and security is on the top of that pyramid. Yeah. So when you're doing your sort of evaluation of, of projects and what gets done and what get, doesn't get done, for me, safety starts at the very top. Well, then functionality, do we need it to function kind of thing? And then is it nice to have? Is it pretty? Is it lovely? You have that hierarchy running constantly through your brain because you do have limited funds. Not everybody gets a new fully paved road and whatever else they need, they think that they want or need at that stage of the game. I think it's also important that when people come forward with projects, like say for us, because you brought up roads and that's always a bone of contention, every rural municipality. We Not in the winter though at all, right? right? Because no one ever complains <laughs> about roads in the winter in Alberta. <laughs> What roads? Yeah. No, we'll, we get it both. Seasonally, we're both, uh, you know, like, because we do have a lot of gravel roads, we tend to get, as you know, equal complaints, just different things at those stages of the game. So, um, like with roads, sometimes it's a process of educating people about what they want and how it's going to impact them. A lot of people with gravel roads, well, I want a paved road. Okay, well, great. Are you prepared to deal with all the extra traffic that's now going to come down your paved road because it's a paved road? Great. Well, let's talk about that. Do you want people speeding or do you want you know, dust with actually, it just, it really depends. And often when you're having that consultation and having those discussions with people, um, they'll give you information that you, you know, maybe haven't thought of before, or they'll help you establish the hierarchy based upon how they're thinking. And obviously it's my job to listen to them, to the people that are most impacted. Sometimes it's a matter of saying, we don't have the money and this can't be a priority right now. It's nice to have, it's on the radar, but unfortunately, you know, I've got I need to have mental health programs because coming out of COVID, apparently almost everybody has lost their mind. I was already there beforehand. So, but um, I have to deal with this first before I deal with that. <laughs> are, are people willing to accept the answer? No, because I, I, I think what you're getting to in, please correct me if I'm wrong here, is you listen to people, even their, their concerns, their wants and their needs. But if you explain to them that, unfortunately, this would mean if you want this project done, this road fixed or this mm -hmm. sidewalk in, this means it's going to be costing you extra on your tax dollars. And mm -hmm. do you want that? Are people willing to sort of 
listen to you because often it's the counselor being listen the one who's listening but when the resident or the taxpayer needs to listen are they willing to listen to what you have to say when it comes to mm -hmm. potentially saying no to them yes and no some are and some are. and this is this is actually a like this question pulls me back cuz honestly one of the criticisms i have sometimes of my colleagues and when i say colleagues i'm talking politicians worldwide is yeah. that we won't say no we will say Oh, have you seen the sunshine today? Or look, there's a dog instead of answering the question with a yes or a no. And I know when I was elected, I ran into this issue multiple times, knowing full well that a, a project or a situation wasn't or couldn't happen. And then having them tell me, well, your other counselor was supportive or, your, or didn't say no or didn't say this or didn't say that. I think we need to get better at saying no and explaining why we're saying no as opposed to avoiding the answer to questions, first and foremost. Most people, I think, if you talk to them honestly, will listen. Now, will they agree with you? Not necessarily. They might hate your guts after. Um, but understanding the situation fully, like I say, I think a lot of issues come out of the fact that people are not willing to say no or give a concrete answer or a concrete explanation because they don't want to be unpopular. They don't want to lose that vote. I promised myself when I got into this job, I was not going to change. I was not going to lie to people. And for me, one of the things is being straightforward. And so sometimes a no is the only answer you've got. I have done, this will be my 180th episode with municipal leaders from across Canada. I have heard BS on my this time on these shows, and don't get me wrong, I, I think everyone has the right to say what they want, but that is the most refreshing statement I've ever heard on this show. Um, how do you hold yourself to that? Because the job changes you, and I don't care who you are, even if the most well-intended person, how do you ensure that you keep to the values that you've set out when you got elected in 2019 to be a straight shooter? Because in, in our... 35 minute conversation already. I feel like I've not gotten one BS answer from you in our entire interview. How do you still be who you are while understanding that the job as a municipal politician or a politician in general can potentially change you and not be that? Yeah, I know. Um... <laughs> and I apologize to put you on the spot no. here. I, just, I, find, I find that answer that you just gave so fascinating and so semi-refreshing. You know, thank you. And I appreciate that. And I think um, it's hard for me to be anybody but who I am. I am an extremely outspoken, outgoing person. That's how I was raised. So I think part of it is it's just drilled into me. Another part, to be honest, is I don't, I'm not one of those people who likes getting caught in a lie or a half truth. So if you have to keep all these stupid half truths clear in your head, you're going to screw up at some point. So I feel like you're better off to just be honest and deal with the truth of the matter up front because eventually something someone doesn't like is going to come out or whatever. So it's better to deal with it right up front and be up front with it. That's always been kind of my philosophy as we move forward. Now, I've contemplated provincial politics at some point. I'm not sure I could even do that because I don't think I could tow a party line. I think if there was something stupid going on in my party and they asked me to, to further that idea, I don't think I could do it. Um, and I know there's a lot of times for me when I'm listening to other people provide answers that are not answers and I am getting frustrated inside my internal, I'm hoping it's an internal eye roll is happening because sometimes it pops out into uh, the public, but, um, I would prefer to be told no and why than to be given the, Oh, maybe we'll, we'll see and whatever's going to happen. And, and, Oh, look, there's a squirrel. I, I find that demeaning myself. So I try to offer that same courtesy and it's not even a conscious courtesy. It's just who I am. <laughs> you, you you seem like you are, want the best for your community, mm -hmm. which is great. But it, does, it seems like you are comfortable if at the end of the day, if you got defeated or if you stepped down, you did it the way that you meant to do it when you set out to do this job in 2019. Would that be correct? Absolutely. I um, Absolutely. And the number of times I've had people contact me and say, hi, I'm a voter and a taxpayer. And I say, oh, good. So am I. It's great to know you. <laughs> Um, it's fabulous. Uh, yeah, I'm not in this job because I wanted this job per se. I didn't wake up one morning and go, I really want to be a politician. What a great idea. Half the population can hate me and the other half doesn't. Um, no, I well, can't. The other half doesn't realize who you are. That's right. right? <laughs> I know I'm anonymous. Everybody. Yeah. So like, it's not a great job for your ego. I know maybe in certain areas where you get like a crowd rolling and happy, but 
contrived anger coming out of politicians to get to get people revved up and things like that I've never had any respect for people that weren't um, being at least as close to their genuine self as they can and you see it right off the cuff you can tell what people are doing may maybe I won't be elected but I kind of always said to myself you know what if I'm doing a good job for people and they're happy with it that's great because that's the best I can do why would I lie about it to keep a job that nobody likes me in doesn't make sense so I'm here as a representative of the people. Like I say, I'll take the portions of hate that I get. I'll take the portions of understanding. And honestly, I've met some great people who I never would have met, some experiences I never would have had. So there's value coming out of this that I'll have for my entire life. I'm not going to be left bereft if people decide they don't like me because I told them no. I appreciate that. I am cautious of time here, and I want to turn to the last subject here, and it's my favorite subject, and that is tourism. <laughs> I don't think municipalities do a good enough job talking about tourism. And that's just my own personal opinion. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you are. That is my own personal mm -hmm. opinion. If, say, hypothetically, 2024, a certain podcast host was going to be coming through Sturgeon County and stopping <laughs> into District 2, along uh -huh. with District 5, I believe uh, Neil's from, uh, District 5 uh -huh. or 6, so <laughs> wrong here. Yeah. What should I be seeing? What are some of the tourism spots that I should be seeing in 2024? Oh, I'd have to add, well, definitely you need to visit some of our farms, our more unique farms. We've got like lakeside dairies here that makes their own in-house cheese. And I don't think most people have ever actually had real cheese made from just milk and not plastic. Um, so that's a fantastic, neat little operation that folks can go out to. Birchwood Meadows is fantabulous. It's run by Corey Christopher, who is quite a character himself, but it's a you pick flower farm um, where each sort of flower stem is priced and you wander around this fantastic garden and Corey Christopher like I say is a fantastic individual very creative so he set up a myriad of spots that are geared to bring in younger people to these flower gardens they literally have Instagram backgrounds but really cool kitschy stuff like he's taken like old ghetto blasters and painted them pink and created these fabulous little vistas throughout the farm amongst the amazing flowers I loved it there um peace on earth organic farming most people have no idea well i've been convinced i need a flamethrower ever since i went through this organic garden because that's how they get rid of weeds i'd love to be out in my garden burning the whole thing up but uh just you know please don't say that in 2024 when we're <laughs> under our drought conditions please know, do not I, say that <laughs> i know i know it's either drought or flood you can't get it right like am i just like a moderate year at some point but there's a ton of little things, even just touring out and looking at the canola fields. For some people coming from other countries, let's be honest, seeing open space with no human beings in it and just cows is fantastic. Little lakes all throughout the place. Like it's just a beautiful community. Um, I wish I could also recommend that people somehow go and engage in some of the smaller areas of our community because we have small communities like out in Riviera, Kabar and Kalahu that have these great families that have been for years and generations and they've really taken charge of community and created such a great community feel and little amenities for themselves. Like I wish I could recommend people engage in the culture for a few days, but that's unfortunately not possible, but it is much, much different than an urban center. <laughs> Well, you've just pulled the clip that I'm going to promote this episode with on that statement there. So what was that? Uh, uh, the, the go out into the okay. smaller communities, because I truly believe that uh, we always talk about the grass is always greener on the other side. Well, let's go explore these other sides. Let's go explore uh -huh. our rural heartland of Alberta yeah. and Canada, because I think it yeah. truly does have a story. We need to get outside of our urban centers. And I'm a big proponent of getting outside of the urban centers. Don't get me wrong. They play an important part of the country. Yeah. But I I love rural Alberta. Um, I want to end on one last question, and it's kind of encapsulates the entire interview, but it's the important one. What makes Sturgeon County such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I hate to be stereotypical because I know that this is probably an answer you've heard 8,000 times, but it is our people. Like, that's the difference. Honestly, this morning I woke up and my house smells like sewage. I know, lucky me, right? So I texted one of my rural community members, like I'm divorced this year. So some of the blue jobs are off. He rushed straight out here, despite having a broken neck, checked out the top of my house and went, it's your vents. What do you need help with? Let me help you. Like, that's something I didn't get in the city. Someone driving, I don't know how many miles just to look at the top of my house and to be here and see if it's okay. Like, uh, that level of neighborliness, I guess, is 
huge here. And it's not just a few people in the center. It's everybody. Like they go out of their way for each other. They set up programs for each other. Neighbors help neighbors regularly. Like, and I've seen, and not just helping in El Paso, a cup of sugar. They're out there, you know, digging ditches for six weeks level of helping neighbors. The wow. things you can't get some of your urban neighbors to do with 6,000, you know, six packs of beer. They're just doing it because they're your neighbor and it's important to them and the people are important to them. And like I say, some of our smaller communities that are populated by neighbors that have been here for hundreds of years and the families that have known each other and still inclusive to relative newcomers like myself, because I haven't been here hundreds of years. <laughs> Counselor Kristen, I want to thank you so much. This has been an eye-opening interview, and I'm so happy that uh, to kick off our first week back on the show, we were able to sit down with you and talk about Sturgeon County, but also talk about the role of a municipal counselor. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Now, if you found today's episode insightful and informative, we encourage you to take a moment and hit that subscribe button. By doing so, you ensure that you stay abreast of all our latest content, ranging from the municipal affairs to the in-depth insights of the cross-border interviews and the revealing exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, as a platform committed to providing comprehensive coverage of all things municipal, we aim to keep you well-informed, and engaged. Now your support is crucial in enabling us to grow and maintain the high quality of content that you've come to expect. Now, if you find it within your means, please consider backing the show. Every contribution, regardless of size, goes a long way in sustaining and enhancing the depth and breadth of our programming. Now you can find the link to our support page on the Cross Border Interviews website, conveniently located in the show notes. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.